Hello, you sentient ball of stardust. My name is Casey Davis. I'm a therapist, and I'm an author of the book, How to Keep House While Drowning, where I talk about ways to make it a little bit easier to take care of yourself when you're overwhelmed, stressed, have mental health issues, physical health issues, or maybe you're just in a hard season of life. Maybe you're looking for a place that you can come and listen to some practical advice. This is a podcast for all of the self-help rejects. We're going to talk about skills for survival and self-kindness. And I'm going to leave the pop psychology at the door. I promise not to tell you to meditate or to journal. We're just going to give you some really insightful conversations with hopefully some practical advice. So I don't believe you need to pick yourself up by the bootstraps. I don't want you to just try harder. And I don't believe that laziness exists. So join me over on Struggle Care, where we can find compassionate solutions that help us function a little bit better. New on Curiosity Stream. I'm James Burke. I'm going to take you on a journey through time. James Burke's visionary series returns, reimagined for our time. Now, this is all uncharted territory. The Washington Post hails Burke as one of the most intriguing minds in the Western world. The New York Times raves he careens from one great moment in history to another. Where do we want to go from here? Experience all new connections. So what's the next connection? With monthly, annual, and bundled plans, find the one that works for you at curiositystream.com. Stove Leg Media, igniting conversation. Hey y'all, how's it going? As you know, my name's Elena Grace, and you're listening to another episode of I've Been Thinking. So today's a solo episode. Um, I've been going back and forth about this one, um, about what it was going to be. This is actually not what I had planned for this week. Um, originally at least, and then it was the only thing that I wanted to do, it turns out, and it just, this is just what happened. So, a year ago this week, um, you're listening to this on Friday the 15th, which is actually mine, Adam's two-year anniversary, um, a year ago yesterday, the 14th my papa passed away, my grandpa. And that took a huge toll on me mentally. Um, and so I wanted to talk to you all today about growth in grief and some coping mechanisms, right? Um, because I know that, I mean, this can happen to anybody at any time. And it's really difficult and we're not always given, um, you know, a playbook on how to deal with it. Some people, I guess, probably do. They have therapists or whatever. I have dealt with a lot of loss throughout the years, um, but this one probably hit me the hardest out of any of them. And so... Um, his death really, I mean, it kicked off my downward mental health spiral and really only recently have I begun to truly cope with it. Like it rocked me to my core, y'all. And a lot of the reason for that is that I had a lot of things I wasn't dealing with that I was just kind of pushing to the back burner saying, I'll deal with that later, whatever, and um, his death really brought those to light for me. And so that was bad enough. But then I had some other things happen in my personal life that really distracted me. They happened literally right after. So right as I would have been going into the true like grieving and finding peace process... Um, I had these other things happen that really distracted me and took all of my energy. And so I dealt with those things instead of grieving in the moment. So that was really hard for me. And I had a lot of anger and bitterness in my heart on top of the sadness because I was so distracted and couldn't grieve properly. 
And I mean, I remember telling Allison months later, like in May or June, probably that I felt like I hadn't really gotten to grieve at all because I had spent so much of my energy dealing with those other things. And I really felt robbed of the process of coming to terms with it. And that made things even worse for me, right? So I suffered from depression consistently during the first half of 2020 because of all of this. And I still do now here and there. Um, The depression, I've had that on and off throughout life. So that's not like a new thing because of this. But I think the weight of it was really different. And like I said, I still have it in bouts now. So if you've been around for a while, you know that I'm pretty open about my mental health and all that stuff. Um, And you might have listened to my mental health episode from back in the summer where I talk some about my journey to seeking medication for my mental health. That's not really what I was seeking, but I was like, I've got to do something. Anyway... Getting medicated for my anxiety and subsequently my depression was looped in with that. That was pivotal to me being able to actually start focusing on dealing with things because it gave me an emotional baseline to work from, right? And I have thought about seeking therapy one day, maybe for an amalgam of things, not just this, but I'm not ready for that yet. To be honest, um, I think that that is something that you have to be ready for on one level or another. And I'm just not there right now. Um, But because of all of this, so I tell you all of this to tell you that I wanted to bring to y'all today a little honesty and openness, first of all. Not that I'm really ever not open. But I wanted to share with you some ways, first of all, that I dealt very poorly with loss, okay? For example, I absolutely lashed out, like not immediately, but after a little while, my anger at not being able to cope with this loss got to be too much, and I mean, I was awful to be around. And that was one of the reasons that I went to get help with my depression and anxiety because I was pushing away my closest friends, even Adam. Um, Nobody enjoyed being around me and I didn't like that. Uh, That was really when I realized how bad it was, was when my friends didn't want to go places with me because I was being so awful. I also found the loss very hard to talk about. And, you know, that's fair at first, at least. It can be really hard to talk about for a lot of people. Um, But it kind of is a family trait on my dad's side. Um, And this was my daddy's dad. Um, They don't talk about things. We all kind of keep our emotions on the inside, especially when they're emotions that we feel like they might burden someone else or maybe they make us feel weak. We don't like that. (laughs) And, you know, we just try to coop it up inside and that's, that's toxic, honestly, because the more you do that, the more difficult it gets to cope. I have found that as awkward as I may feel talking about it, um, I don't talk about it with everyone typically, but the people that love you, they will listen to you talk if that's what you need. And so just keep that in mind and keep in mind that you're not a burden. If someone loves you, you'll never be a burden. So, because I don't like talking about these things, um, I don't know if you can tell, but I'm still a little awkward talking about it even now. Because I don't like talking about these kinds of things, it was also really difficult for me to let people know that something was going on in my life at all. And that maybe I needed a little space or a little grace. 
I, I mean, I would have missed like one day of work, gone in and acted like nothing was wrong if, like, if it hadn't been for my mom and Allison and probably Adam, I'm sure, telling me, Elena, you need to call and let them know that, like, something has happened in your family and that you can't come to work for a few days. Because I would have been right there, like, not the next day. I was pretty catatonic the next day. But the day after that, I would have been there. And my family was like, Elena, you need to take a few days. You're not okay. You can't go in like this. And I'm grateful that they made me take that time, first of all. But I'm also grateful that they made me tell my boss. And... You know, I couldn't even tell my boss to his face that something was wrong. Like, that's how awkward I am about all of this. (laughs) But I had to text him to let him know, like, hey, I know I talked to you and you told me I could leave work early, but, like, this is why I needed to and this is why I won't be in for a few days. I just, I really don't like asking for help if I can help it, but you have to humble yourself when these kinds of things happen because you'll really put yourself at a major disadvantage if you don't ask for a little help or at the very least if you don't ask for a little bit of space for yourself to heal in. Now I want to bring you all some strategies now that I've talked to you a little bit about some of the things that I did wrong and some of the wisdom that I learned from that. I want to talk to you all about a few like strategies, tips and tricks, whatever you want to call it, that I have found for successfully coping with grieving the loss of a loved one. Are we ready? It's a list. Um, not too long of a list. It, it's pretty, pretty simple. First and foremost, you have to care for yourself. Literally, at the base level, you need to drink water and you need to eat food. Your body needs strength and you deserve a treat, frankly. Um, The day my papa died, we knew it was coming, so I left work early, like I said. We knew it would be like that day. And so I called Adam and told him, and he. this was when we lived an hour apart, And he drove to me to be with me. My roommates left the house um, so that I would have some space to just, like, be sad. Um, They left the house for a few hours, and Adam brought me steak and shake because, honestly, I would not have fed myself otherwise. I wouldn't have gotten out of bed. I didn't get out of bed um, for probably... I don't know, 18 hours. I just laid in the bed. Um, My friends, they made sure that I ate. Uh, They knew that I didn't really have the energy to do that for myself, to do that basic act of taking care of myself. They knew that that was just something I wasn't capable of in the moment, which I think is not an uncommon um, coping mechanism, like in the moment when a loss is very fresh, Taylor brought me Reese cups. That was like the sweetest thing ever. <laughs> Cause I love a Reese. And she, uh, she knew I was really sad. So she brought me Reese cups, which was so sweet of her. And like I said, Adam brought me food and people were just making sure that I was taking care of myself. Allison, made sure that I showered. She bought me like a tea or something at Starbucks and brought to me, you know, all of those things or hot chocolate, something like that. I don't remember, but my friends thankfully made me make myself a priority because I couldn't do that for myself. Um, so what I want to recommend to you is if you have the ability, either, (laughs) Make sure that you can make yourself a priority. So make sure that you eat and drink. Or ask one of your loved ones who can to hold you responsible to that. 
So thankfully I had my two roommates there with me and I had Adam there and they made sure that I ate and I drank water and all of that. Cause like I said, I wouldn't have. Um, so either if you can hold yourself responsible to that or ask somebody else to make sure that you do those things. Cause that is really like baseline <laughs> essential. So next, number two, be in the moment. Now that sounds kind of awful um, when you're in pain, I'll be honest. You don't really want to be in the moment. You want to just be numb and you want to just ignore everything that's going on. But to take notice of all of the little things, to focus on what you're doing or where you are right now, that can help you ground you so much, right? So in the days after my papa passed, especially that next day, I was absolutely in a fog. Like when I say I was catatonic, I literally mean I only have flashes of any kind of memory from that next day. I went to the mall um, that morning. Cause I was like, well, I've got to get a dress for the funeral. Like I might as well go right now. It'll make me get out of bed. And I uh, literally, like, I remember showing up, Allison was at work and I went over and I looked at dresses. I tried on the first black dress I found and that's what I bought. Um, I went and got Allison from work and made her take a break. Well, actually she took a break probably because she saw that I wasn't functioning and she held my hand and made me like take a walk around the mall with her just to get me to like move around she had to hold my hand and guide me like I couldn't do anything um I packed for the funeral by just like throwing things in a bag and hoping it was fine like, I wasn't okay. I highly do not recommend that. So definitely put work into focusing on the little things because those, like, that's life. And the fog that I was in, I was not a living creature in those moments. You know what I'm saying? It was not at all a good way of dealing with it. Um, And truly, it did not save me any pain to allow myself to be that numb because it just made the pain last longer. Some really good options, too, for being in the moment includes like meditation, prayer. Those can be super helpful in managing emotional and physical symptoms as well. Um, You know, with grief a lot of the time we'll experience anger anxiety headaches nausea like all kinds of things like that and meditation and prayer can really and or prayer you know whatever can really help you deal with that it helps you focus on the moment just a little bit more um, but also you have to focus on what you're feeling and focus inside of yourself as well so that's really important all right Number three, talk about it. Avoiding the topic really (laughs) disrupts the healing process. And it can seriously lead to like feelings of isolation. I think that it's really helpful to share stories about your loved one with others, for example. So... I really, in the days after, I loved going through photos of my papa to send to my mom so she could make a slideshow to be played at his visitation services. So that was really fun for me. I had some special pictures and videos of him and with him that I was able to sort through and, you know, remember those really good moments. And some I'm sure that I sent plenty to Adam in those moments that I showed plenty of them to Allison and Taylor and said, oh, this is the time that this happened or, you know, whatever. 
And um, my favorite is still, there's a video of him when Winnie was brand new. She was like two and a half, almost three months old. And he babysat her. And he had the time of his life doing that. And he was telling me about how she was just like a little bullet in the yard. And she would just take off running and run circles around this huge yard that he had and all of that. And, you know, sharing those kinds of stories, just like it did just now, that is really, it, it makes you talk about it instead of isolating yourself from the subject and it helps you cope with it in the long term, right? Um, I talked about my feelings a lot with Adam in the weeks and months afterward, which that was really easy to do with him um, since I was constantly like breaking down in tears at random and crying about missing him. Um, <laughs> But whether you're doing it like that or whether you're sharing a story like I did with you all just now, those are great, great coping mechanisms, great ways to get out of your head, essentially, about the loss. Um, Because otherwise you'll just sit on it and you'll never be able to talk about it ever. And it'll just be... A tender, unhealing sore, you know, that's just open and you can never touch it. So, however you do it, it is really important to work towards that um, because it keeps you from emotionally cutting yourself and others off. Another great tip what is this? Number four help others. Who are dealing with the loss as well. So spending time with fellow loved ones who have experienced this loss. Um, maybe share stories with them. Maybe visit special places together. Or physically help them with things that they need. That can help you overcome the loss as well. Right? Um, so something that I did. I went to TJ Maxx. <laughs> And I spent, like, a ton of money. But I bought all this stuff for a basket to put together for my grandmother to give her. It was, like, a little spa basket. And it was, like, bubble bath and Epsom salt and, you know, all these little things. And I put them in a bag and I was like, you know, this is for Mama. Um... And just doing that was a really great way of me putting my energy rather into, rather than putting it into being sad, I put my energy into trying to help someone else. And I still look back and think about how glad I am that I did that because it was such a small thing. And I mean, I was literally in a fog as I was doing that even but I love giving um you all know that if you've been around here for any amount of time I love giving and I love helping and that was a great way for me to give of myself to help somebody else and that really helped me um feel better in the moment about everything that was going on and finally Number five, I didn't mean for this to be like an even five, but here we go. Um, Number five is exercise, okay? Now, when I tell y'all I was crying in the gym, I'm not kidding. I'm like stretching and tears were streaming down my face, but I'm there. I'm powering through. I'm crying on the treadmill, but the exertion of that energy was super important to calming me down and helping me move through all of these emotions. I, yeah, that was a really great way for me to deal with it um, kind of on a daily basis. And even now, I find 
um, a lot of emotional release in going to the gym, getting on the treadmill. I was mad at Adam yesterday (laughs) and got on the treadmill and speed walked for 30 minutes and I felt so much better. Like I wasn't really mad at him afterwards. Um, after one mile, I was actually pre- calming down pretty good. And then I just, that was a great way for me to deal with my emotions, right? So I really highly recommend exercise to help you get that energy out. And while you're exercising, then you can, or afterwards, after you've got all that extra nervous energy, you can focus your thoughts on coping And hopefully you can have a better experience (laughs) than I did. Plus, you know, as Elle Woods said, exercise gives you endorphins and endorphins make you happy. So, you know, what better to do when you're feeling down than try to get some endorphins going in the bloodstream? (laughs) Now, ultimately, y'all, this is what I want to instill in you. That grief is a process, right? It is so incredibly difficult to move through. I mean, it's like a tumultuous, it's like a tumultuous ocean, you know? And it's super easy to get lost in, to get sucked into, and to never be able to pull yourself out. Um, But the secret I have found is to spend time in your grief. Give yourself the opportunity and the grace to put energy into it. Don't sit and dwell in your grief. Don't think I'm telling you to do that. But without giving yourself the opportunity to spend time dealing with it, like don't try to put it on the back burner. Don't sit in it and wallow in it. Sit in the middle, okay? Spend an appropriate amount of time thinking about it, realizing what has happened, all of those things. Give yourself the grace to do that. Because without it, you can't experience the growth and healing that comes with successfully coping with any kind of loss. Whether it's the loss of a loved one, the loss of a pet, the loss of a really important job, whatever it is, like you can have grief come from all kinds of different sources, you know, the loss of what you thought your life would be, all of those things. You can grieve. You you can grieve for many different reasons. So coping with loss is hard and it's a very personal situation. But like I said, these are just a few of the tips and tricks, strategies that I have used after I realized how poorly I was dealing with what I had gone through. So don't be me. Don't lash out. Don't almost lose your friends. Don't act bad. Don't refuse to deal with it. Spend time on it. Spend time on yourself because you're worth it. And... Make sure that you devote the time that you need to getting past this. You might not ever get over it, but you do have to get through it. And you might carry it with you for the rest of your life, but that's okay. As long as it doesn't cripple you. Just let it make you stronger. (laughs) So on the blog post for today, y'all, I'm going to link just a few of the resources that I use to compile this list, um, as well as some of the resources that I used in my personal journey. So check out ivebeenthinkingpod.com and then click the blog tab for today's post. And if it's not on the top of the post, um, you can search for it, of course, on the site. So, yeah, guys, thank you so much for listening. Thank you for being here. I hope that any grief that you're experiencing or 
have experienced or maybe will in the future. I hope truly that this can be of some kind of help to you. Make sure that you all subscribe to the Patreon for early access to episodes and for extra content. Also, we have a little special coming up where um, I think it's going to be the first five people to subscribe to the Patreon are going to get a free I've Been Thinking sticker sent to them in the mail. I'm super excited. So make sure that um, you keep an eye on the website, on the Patreon, on the Instagram, all that stuff. I will announce it. Um, So that is even people at the $5 tier. Make sure that you are ready to subscribe. Okay. Give us a follow on Instagram so you can keep an eye out for our special at I've Been Thinking Pod. And also let me know what you thought on our latest Instagram post. Subscribe to us wherever you listen. And if you use Apple Podcasts, definitely give us those five stars. And also, I want to ask you a favor. Please recommend the podcast to somebody you know. Especially this episode. um, Or especially an episode that you think might relate to something they have going on, whether it's this one, whether it's the mental health episode, whether they love um, fast fashion and you think that maybe they need called out a little bit on not taking part in it so much, maybe it's the opposite. Maybe they want uh, some inspiration on uh, being even better at being environmentally friendly, you know, whatever it is, send an episode to a friend and say, hey, give this girl a listen. I think you'd really love her. I would be really grateful if you did that. All right. Thanks for listening, guys. I will talk at y'all next week. Bye. Hello, you sentient ball of stardust. My name is Casey Davis. I'm a therapist and I'm an author of the book, How to Keep House While Drowning, where I talk about ways to make it a little bit easier to take care of yourself when you're overwhelmed, stressed, have mental health issues, physical health issues, or maybe you're just in a hard season of life. Maybe you're looking for a place that you can come and listen to some practical advice. This is a podcast for all of the self-help rejects. We're going to talk about skills for survival and self-kindness. And I'm going to leave the pop psychology at the door. I promise not to tell you to meditate or to journal. We're just going to give you some really insightful conversations with hopefully some practical advice. So I don't believe you need to pick yourself up by the bootstraps. I don't want you to just try harder. And I don't believe that laziness exists. So join me over on Struggle Care, where we can find compassionate solutions that help us function a little bit better. New on Curiosity Stream. I'm James Burke. I'm going to take you on a journey through time. James Burke's visionary series returns, reimagined for our time. Now, this is all uncharted territory. The Washington Post hails Burke as one of the most intriguing minds in the Western world. The New York Times raves he careens from one great moment in history to another. Where do we want to go from here? Experience all new connections. So what's the next connection? With monthly, annual, and bundled plans, find the one that works for you at curiositystream.com.